Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Eiderberg, and uh, this presentation is uh, related to actuators and uh, gripper sizing. We are in Module 8. We will go to the reference material and click Lecture 8, Actual Grippers. And uh, in this uh, presentation, we will uh, talk about uh, several topics and the topics are listed in uh, this slide. We will look at uh, different types of uh, robot interfaces, which include both mounting bases and grippers. We'll see uh, how the uh, mounting frames should be constructed. We we'll look at the robot operation uh, when it is uh, working on top of a linear or rotary moving stage. We'll see uh, different type of uh, mechanisms which are used in robotic actuators, such as uh, ball screw stages, belt-driven uh, devices, and uh, rotary devices. And then we'll talk about the different type of grippers which are used in robotics. When we're talking about the uh, frame, it is important to see that uh, the robot uh, and the frame become an integral part. So if we said earlier that the robot should be designed to be of lightweight and high stiffness, the same holds true for the frame. You could imagine that if this robot would be accelerating at very high uh, rate and the frame is not going to be rigid enough then the whole body is going to be vibrating, not because of the robot, but because of the uh, flexible frame. So we like to have high stiffness in the frame, low weight and uh, high natural frequency, such that the bandwidth of the robot will stay high. We would uh, also require leveling pads to uh, align the robot uh, properly with respect to uh, uh, devices such as indexing table or uh, linear belts which are acting under it, uh, then uh, we uh, may need to include uh, linear stages like we see over here on the uh, frame and mount the robot uh, on it. Or similarly, we could mount the robot on a rotary table. Uh, vision cameras are always uh, useful when we're dealing with a large AB offset and we like to minimize the overall absolute uh, accuracy. And uh, floor anchoring is sometimes uh, a, a definite requirement, especially in areas like California, uh, fabs, uh, these are uh, uh, factories uh, which uh, manufacture uh, uh, high precision uh, semiconductor equipment, uh, the equipment must be anchored uh, to uh, avoid any uh, catastrophic uh, movement during uh, seismic uh, disturbances. And uh, in many cases, in order to provide uh, damping of high frequencies, uh, then manufacturers would uh, use hollow tubes and they will fill them with uh, concrete composite in order to uh, make the uh, overall uh, uh, weight uh, of the uh, beam uh, higher and let the uh, damping also uh, be higher. That will uh, filter out the high frequency disturbances. An example over here is a robot working on uh, a, a, with an indexing table servicing uh, a different conveyor. This is taken from visual components. And over here we see another example from Highwin. We can click on that and take a look at the uh, uh, presentation. We see that uh, in this case uh, we have uh, uh, three robots. One robot over here receives a part and uh, it does an inspection after it's uh, finished its job. And then we have uh, a secondary robot which is uh, traveling over a linear stage and it uh, handshakes uh, the part with the uh, test uh, robot and uh, at the same time there is a third robot 
which is uh, getting the part uh, from uh, the raw part and then does some grinding operation and uh, finishes uh, up the part. And then when the part is uh, finished, the uh, uh, pick and place robot is uh, handshaking it with the uh, grinding robot and then it uses the uh, stage to help it move long travel into the uh, uh, other robot. So uh, this is uh, an example of uh, such a case where a robot is uh, moving on a stage. There are uh, many different types of uh, mechanisms and uh, uh, actuators uh, used uh, in tandem with robots, uh, either part of them or as peripheral equipment that we have to be aware of. And uh, in many cases, uh, the actuators, including motors and uh, armature, and sometimes of a transmission mechanism, a slide and a base, have different mechanisms. And we have to learn how to uh, uh, transfer the inertia of all these mechanisms onto the motor shaft in order to be able to calculate the uh, motor uh, uh, torque and size the uh, motor as well as sizing the entire actuator. So here's an example of a ball screw or lead screw actuator. Here's an example of an indexing table. And here's an example of a belt actuator. Now, process specification uh, typically include the motion profile. Uh, we will see several uh, types of motion profiles in a few minutes that the actuator may need to be carried on and then the load uh, of the uh, parts, the transmission type of mechanism, uh, one of these uh, or another, the actuation type, uh, what type of motor, the precision level which is required, and the environmental disturbances. These are typical the uh, process specification, and then we need to determine the actual the type and size, the uh, transmission train uh, size, the motor type, motor peak torque, continuous torque, motor power, motor velocity, motor voltage and current. And in many high performance systems, we have to also, as I mentioned earlier, be aware of the stiffness, the natural frequency, the servo bandwidth, to see how fast the machine can respond to disturbances, uh, calculate their life, the mean time between failure, mean time to repair, and uh, many times also estimating the cost. These are typical uh, jobs of uh, mechanical engineers, application engineers, system engineers uh, that are involved in automation. This slide shows us two typical common motion profiles that an axis of a robot or an actuator has to be uh, uh, carried on uh, with the elementary calculation formulas to determine uh, the variables which are unknown. So when we see over here in a trapezoidal uh, motion profile of velocity that the uh, uh, system is being accelerated by constant acceleration, the integral of it is the velocity, a straight line, and then we see a constant velocity where velocity doesn't change, and then deceleration uh, and the uh, resulting Displacement is like an S-curve over here with a dwell at the end. This is a typical trapezoidal move one way. And then a triangle move is a similar move but without a constant velocity. So we're moving as fast as possible and then decelerate in order to finish this step. Many times we are given the uh, step size in uh, in length units like meter and the time that it is required to uh, meet that and we have to uh, determine what is the acceleration and velocity that uh, has to be uh, de de developed by the uh, uh, mechanism in order to provide this uh, requirement. So this chart gave us uh, six different combinations for velocity, acceleration, displacement, and time. We can uh, be given any two, and then this formulation will give us the other two. So for example, if we are given, like we said uh, earlier, displacement and time, 
uh, then we can calculate acceleration and velocity during the acceleration phase using this uh, formula. The velocity phase is using uh, simple algebraic formulas and uh, we'll take a look at them uh, uh, too. This uh, is uh, an example of uh, the formulation that we may need to use for the constant velocity. For example, if we uh, need to calculate the total travel, uh, then the total travel will be the travel during acceleration, travel during constant velocity, and travel during deceleration. And then if we uh, need to find out what is the travel during constant velocity, it's simply the uh, velocity during the constant velocity phase uh, times the uh, uh, time uh, during constant velocity, TCV. So a simple formulation like this may be needed to be used when we uh, size up a typical uh, uh, motion profile of a robot link. When we look at a more uh, a complete uh, motion back and forth to define a motion cycle, this is a cycle time. We have the same trapezoidal move forward with the dwell and then coming back with a similar uh, profile uh, on the way back. And we see this is the displacement going all the way up, uh, uh, staying still, and then uh, coming back. And uh, similarly, we have a profile like that, which uh, is uh, a two-way uh, travel uh, with a triangle move. And we see that this is the forward move time, this is the dwell, this is the backward move time, this is the dwell, and this is the complete uh, cycle time. Uh, in many cases, when we have a situation where the acceleration is shown here in red is uh, square, then the rate of change of the acceleration, which is uh, defined as a jerk, is going to be infinite. We're going from zero to a finite level, and we're going from finite level to zero. So at these areas, the rate of change of acceleration, which is the jerk, is infinite, and this is the main root cause for uh, problems in the machines. It causes a lot of vibration, it causes a lot of shock, and may uh, reduce the lifetime. So a way around this is to develop a uh, profile which uh, does not have a, a, square, a, a square acceleration, but rather has triangular acceleration and a square jerk. So if you have a square jerk, the acceleration becomes linear. The velocity becomes like an S-curve. Sometimes it's called a smooth factor or an S-curve because the shape of that velocity profile. And then the uh, uh, the, the displacement is becoming even smoother. And uh, in order to uh, develop this uh, uh, profile that you saw over here, uh, you can, uh, I recommend that you look at the uh, scheme over here. It can be used on uh, Excel spreadsheet, and this is Euler angle, uh, Euler method of uh, numerical integration. You have a time interval over here, the uh, jerk is defined over here, constant unit until a certain time, and then a negative unit. And then the uh, acceleration over here is simply the integral. How do we do the integral? We take the jerk times the uh, uh, incremental time at, uh, interval, and we add to it the previous total uh, acceleration. And then we keep on doing that. The velocity, we do the same with the acceleration, velocity is the integral of acceleration, and displacement integral of velocity, and we add them all up, we get a very nice uh, a curve like this, that uh, if uh, uh, in your upcoming job, uh, you would uh, need to uh, make a proposal to a customer, and you would like to differentiate it, uh, many software sizing programs that companies provide do not allow you to uh, use the jerk in that way. So if you will be able to learn how to do it by studying this chart, uh, that may uh, be uh, uh, helpful and beneficial. And when we look at the more complete, uh, uh, complex uh, motion, we see that the uh, acceleration uh, back and forth and deceleration may not be of the same magnitude. It may be uh, moving in step back and forth 
and uh, this uh, motion profile, which could be typical of a robot uh, axis, uh, could be rather complex. Uh, we see that we have many accelerations over here of different time and different shape. Uh, we do not really calculate average acceleration, but we do calculate a root mean square acceleration by this formula, which is the square root of each one of these accelerations squared times the interval that it is acted on. We add them all up. We divide by the total cycle time, including the dwell. We take the square root, and this is so-called the root mean square. So if we look at the maximum acceleration and multiply that times the mass, this will be the maximum inertial force, which has to be developed, or inertial torque. And when we look at the RMS, it will be the continuous uh, force of torque that the motor will have to develop. So this formulation is very, very uh, useful in uh, motor and actuator sizing. This shows us an example of a complex motion profile in a device which is so-called uh, flying shear. We see that we have on a conveyor a material such as uh, paper plugs that uh, have to be cut at a certain length. And in order to do this, we have a gantry. Here's the driving uh, uh, belt stage with the motor. And we have the cross stage with another belt-driven stage and a motor. It could be also a uh, ball screw or lead screw. And then the slide on the cross stage carries a knife. So the process is that uh, the uh, gantry starts uh, at one end. It accelerates until it is in sync with the velocity of the uh, uh, paper, the relative velocity is zero, and at that time, the knife can start uh, cutting uh, because there is no uh, relative velocity between the uh, uh, cross beam and the paper, so it's going to be a smooth cut. When the knife finishes the cut, it has to decelerate very quickly and accelerate backwards very quickly, and then accelerate backs to the cutting speed, and at the same time, the gantry has to decelerate and then accelerate back and then accelerate in the direction of the paper once again. We see that here for the knife and the belt. So over here, this is the uh, knife is cutting at uh, constant velocity. When it finishes, it has to start decelerating to stop. Then it's accelerating in a negative direction until it stops, and then it goes back into the uh, positive direction uh, to stop over here, and then it accelerates to cutting speed again over here. And exactly at the same time, the gantry has to uh, stop when it finishes, uh, uh, when this guy finishes the cutting, and then it has to uh, decelerate in the, uh, accelerate in the other direction, which is the same as decelerating in the other direction. And then uh, it has to accelerate to stop, and then accelerate to uh, sink velocity. And this time interval uh, is when there's no cutting, and this is exactly the length when we multiply times the velocity of the conveyor of the uh, in between uh, the cuts. So this is a very known uh, flying shear mechanism in automation. When we size actuators and uh, motors, uh, we have to uh, uh, consider the various forces, and uh, forces include all types of sources of uh, uh, disturbances, and uh, we see some of them over here. If this is the direction of motion of this slide, then the total actuator force will have to be in this direction, and it has several resistance force, like the process where we need to do some machining, and it also has inertial forces opposite to the uh, acceleration. It has uh, friction force, and it has also a gravitational force. So the gravity is m times g perpendicular to the ground. It has a component, if this is a slope with an angle theta, in this direction, which is mg sine theta, and that force is going to uh, resist the uh, actuation. And it also has a friction force, which is the normal force to this surface, 
which is the tall mg force times the cosine of theta, will be this long uh, vector perpendicular to this surface. And then we have to multiply distance coefficient of friction to get the friction force. So we see that the total force that the uh, actuator has to include is the, uh, uh, the process force plus the inertial force plus the friction force plus gravity force. And we have to be able to calculate all of these forces in order to size the actuator, uh, both size and, uh, and the motor that drives it. One of the important uh, equations that relate for a uh, ball screw, lead screw, the uh, required motor torque in order to generate a certain force is this equation over here that uh, the motor torque equals to the force generated times the pitch of the ball screw, lead screw divided by 2 pi and the efficiency. And this uh, number over here makes sure that the units are compatible. If we have Newton meter here and we have Newtons and the pitches in millimeter, this takes care of the difference between millimeter and meters. Now, the derivation of this equation is simply if you take these two guys to the uh, left-hand side, you get the uh, energy, the work which is done during one revolution by the torque. This must be equal to the work done by the uh, force of the ball screw during one revolution in which the ball screw advances a, a one pitch. So when you move these two guys downstairs, there you get this relationship. Typically, the efficiency of a lead screw is anywhere from 20% to 80%, and a ball screw will have an efficiency of uh, uh, above 80% to 90-95%. Uh, uh, the uh, useful equations to calculate the uh, moment of inertia uh, of uh, ball screw, lead screw, and maybe pulleys, as we will see, uh, coming up, uh, I've given to us here uh, the moment of inertia of a cylinder is uh, mass times the radius squared divided uh, by uh, uh, by two, and uh, if it is hollow, it's uh, the mass uh, divided by two times the uh, square of the sum of the inner and outer uh, radius. And we have other formulations over here to do it. And of course, the mass is the volume of the cylinders times the uh, density of the cylinder. For a, um, a block or a plate, then we have the moment of inertia and the, uh, this, uh, x along this axis of rotation is m divided by 12m is the mass of this cube uh, times the uh, width squared and the depth squared uh, together gives us the moment of inertia. And these are other formulations that uh, one may uh, use. The uh, way we uh, uh, find equivalent inertia of, a, uh, of an actuator uh, mechanism uh, is shown to us over here. Uh, it may look a little bit involved, but then by the end you do it once, uh, you uh, uh, memorize the rule, and everything comes in uh, pretty uh, Easily. If not, then you have to go through the derivation. So we'll do the derivation to start with, see how it works, and then uh, we will uh, apply the rules. So what we have here is a motor uh, which is running at uh, a certain uh, uh, omega in radius per second. And then we have a ball screw, lead screw, and uh, it has its own inertia, and it's moving the slide over here with a weight at a certain velocity. So one of the questions that we have is what is the total inertia of this uh, system that the uh, motor will have to uh, act against? So the total inertia uh, is uh, being derived by looking first at the total kinetic energy of this system. The total kinetic energy is one half the motor inertia times uh, its uh, angular velocity squared plus the inertia of the ball screw times its angular velocity squared, plus the mass of this uh, moving weight times its uh, velocity squared. These are linear velocities, these are angular velocity. So the equivalent inertia of uh, all of these uh, mechanisms on the motor shaft is, uh, must have the same kinetic energy. And what it will be, the I equivalent times the 
moto eh, up, eh, moto eh, eh, velocity squared times one half must be equal to that. So now what we see is that the one half and one half can be cancelled out. By omega squared cannot be cancelled out because we have omega squared here, omega squared here, and over here we have v squared. So we have to find out what is v in terms of omega. So what is v in terms of omega? v equals to omega in radians per second divided by 2 pi, which makes it revolutions per second, multiplying times the pitch in millimeter divided by 1,000 makes it in meter, and now we have the velocity in meters per second. So now we can go back to this equation. Instead of v squared, plug in this value with the omega, and we come up with the total inertia in terms of omega uh, squared, and now we can cancel out the omega squared and what we find out is that the total inertia is the motor inertia, both screw, and the reflected inertia of this uh, uh, mass onto the uh, motor shaft, where the reflected inertia is m times uh, uh, pitch divided by 2 pi times uh, uh, squared. And this is uh, taking care of the, uh, uh, this whole quantity, pitch divided by 2 pi squared, and this takes care of the units. Very important to remember that. And then the motor torque will be the total uh, inertia, as we find it over here, uh, times the uh, alpha, the angular acceleration of this uh, uh, motor. So the reflected inertia is the inertia of a load onto the motor shaft. The equivalent inertia is the inertia of the entire mechanism on the motor shaft. And the total inertia is the equivalent inertia of the mechanism plus the inertia of the motor itself, if it was not part of the equivalent inertia. Now, let's take a look at some other examples. Now, this example has... Uh, a primary belt and a secondary belt, and they are connected together. So, first of all, we have to realize that the belt uh, at this point has the same velocity as this point, and therefore the velocity of this uh, uh, pulley at this point is the same as this one. So the velocity of uh, pulley A is omega A times RA. Velocity of pulley B is omega B times RB. They must be equal to each other. Therefore, we have a relationship omega B divided by omega A equals to RA divided by RB. We need that in order to find the equivalent inertia of B onto A because uh, we will use this expression the same way we used before. So let's start with the kinetic energy once again. The kinetic energy of the equivalent inertia is one-half equivalent inertia times omega A squared. That's where we want to have the equivalent inertia. And this is equal to one-half IA, the inertia of this length, times its own omega, omega A squared, plus IB times omega B squared. But now we can substitute uh, the expression of omega b in terms of omega a such that they will cancel. And what we come up with is that the equivalent inertia is uh, ia, which is the uh, first inertia, plus ib times ra divided by rb squared. And this is the small formula we like to remember. If you want to find the equivalent inertia of this mechanism, it is equal to this inertia plus this inertia times the ratio of the radius of this one over the ratio of this one squared. And uh, sometimes we're given the number of teeth, which is uh, proportional to the radius, divided by the number of teeth of uh, this one over this one squared. So you can go through the derivation and find the reflected inertia of B onto uh, uh, A is the inertia of B on its own shaft times RA divided by RB uh, squared. And then with total inertia, we add up to it the uh, inertia of A multiplied times alpha, and then we know what uh, torque we will require to uh, drive this system. We can use the same system over here. We've got going through the entire derivation. Uh, this is uh, gears instead of belts, but the idea is the same. The velocity at this point is the same for both of them. 
and therefore the reflected inertia of B onto A is the inertia of B along this uh, shaft times the ratio of this radius divided by this radius RA divided by RB squared. And uh, you see it over here, IB times RA divided by RB squared. So we take this one, we go forward, a counter radius uh, divided by its own radius and take the square. This is equivalent inertia and the same as before we add it to the inertia of A uh, and uh, we come up with the total inertia multiplied times alpha and this gives us the required uh, torque for the uh, motor to on this uh, stage. Now we see over here Another uh, formulation, you could, uh, if you ever forget that, uh, Google it within uh, seconds, you'll find uh, many of these uh, derivations. And by the way, all of these uh, uh, sources are taken with a reference over here, and uh, we appreciate the contribution of all of these uh, sources, and we encourage the student to click on them and find out more details about them. Again, we see that the total inertia in this particular mechanism is the motor armature, uh, uh, the motor shaft, and the inertia of the load all on this uh, uh, axis. If we need to find the inertia of the load, and it's a cylinder, it's one half m r squared, and if it's hollow, it's uh, one half m times the inner squared and the outer radius squared. So we've seen that before, we see it again. And let's do a couple more exercises over here with the same principle. So once again, if we have a requirement to find the total inertia on this shaft where the motor is located, then we'll take the inertia J2 and we add to it the inertia of gear two, both of them on the same shaft, so we just add them up. And then we reflect both of them on this shaft. How do we do it? The sum of these two times N1 divided by N2 squared. Now it's reflected on this one. We take this uh, result and add to it the inertia of G1 and J1, which are together on the same shaft. And we find out the equivalent inertia of this mechanism on a motor shaft. We add to it the motor inertia and then we can hit it with the acceleration of the motor to find what torque is needed for the motor to drive this uh, mechanism. So see it over here, N1 divided by N2 squared times uh, J2 with uh, uh, gear, J of gear 2 plus uh, the J of gear 1 plus uh, J1 gives us the uh, solution. Uh, one more time, uh, on uh, this type of mechanism, we want to reflect all of these onto the motor, so we take the load inertia add to it the inertia of gear 4, and then we multiply it times N3 divided by N4 squared. We add to it N3 plus N2. Now we take the whole sum and we reflect it on a motor shaft by multiplying it times N1 divided by N2 squared. Add to it the inertia of gear 1. Add to it the inertia of the motor armature. And we all set to go to calculate the motor torque to drive this uh, uh, load with this uh, actuator mechanism. So you see over here, N3 divided by N4 times gear 4 plus uh, uh, J of the load, and then we add to it gear 3 and gear 2. We multiply times N1 times divided by N2 squared, and then add to it gear 1 and add to it the motor, and we get the total uh, inertia. Now, when we have uh, a uh, situation that uh, the uh, load is directly uh, ran by uh, a lead screw, like we see over here, uh, then the uh, total inertia equals to the motor armature plus the lead screw inertia, and then in order to find out the uh, equivalent inertia or reflected inertia of uh, this uh, block onto the motor shaft, we, uh, given it here, it's mp squared divided 2 pi squared divided by e. Now we recall that mp divided by 2 pi was the, and, and e was the uh, force, but now we have to uh, multiply times the um, 
that's the velocity, and the velocity is omega, and we have to reflect it onto the motor shaft, and this is times the pitch, as we saw earlier, divided by 2 pi, and this is where we're getting the square uh, term. So this is, uh, again, a very useful uh, formulation to find the reflected inertia of uh, a block, which is driven by a Bosch screw or lead screw, uh, with this uh, formula. When we have a block uh, driven by a belt, and we want to find its uh, reflected inertia of this system, and then the uh, total inertia is the motor inertia plus this pulley inertia, and add to it this pulley inertia because moving the same velocity, and then we have to add the mass, and it's almost like a concentrated mass times the radius squared. This will be the inertia of this mass on a motor shaft. And then the belt also is at the distance r, so we have to take the belt mass times the radius square, and this gives us the uh, uh, solution. Over here, we see one more time, uh, probably the last time here, uh, that uh, if we want to calculate this uh, mechanism, we take the load inertia, add to it uh, this uh, gear inertia, multiply times uh, the number of this uh, the teeth divided by the number of this teeth squared, add to it this inertia of this uh, primary pulley, add to it the shaft, add to it the motor inertia, and we come up with the total inertia. When we are uh, dealing with uh, loads and uh, motor inertia, uh, many times it is recommended to have an inertial ratio between the uh, load, the uh, equivalent inertia of all the mechanism, and the uh, motor inertia. We want that ratio to be uh, about 10 to 1, uh, no more than 20 to 1. This is so-called inertia ratio. The reason is, is if we have any uh, flexible connection between the two, what may happen if this inertia is going to be very, very large, the motor is going to be driving this uh, flexible coupling like a spring, and it's not going to make this uh, uh, large inertia move very fast. So it's going to be uh, moving pretty much uh, full speed in uh, neutral. So to assure that this is responding, we want to make sure that the inertia ratio with the standard coupling is uh, at about the ratio of 10. Now what do we do when the inertia ratio is uh, greater than 10? Then we can use a gearbox. Because if there's a gear reduction between the motor shaft and the load, and then the uh, equivalent inertia of the load with the gearbox is the load inertia divided by the reduction of speed. This is high, this is low squared. So this is another useful way of uh, removing. So if we have, for example, a, uh, a, a, a ratio of 100 uh, to 1, and we want to reduce it 10 to 1, we use a gear ratio of uh, 10 to 1, and then we'll have 100 uh, divided by uh, uh, 100, and we can uh, uh, get uh, 1 to 1. And uh, if we uh, use uh, maybe 5 to 1, then we'll uh, come up with a, a different uh, a relation at 100 divided by 25 will give us a ratio of uh, uh, 4 or 5. So this uh, uh, is a very useful uh, way of assuring that the system uh, will uh, act under servo uh, properly. What we see here is uh, a, a sizing tool that many companies that uh, manufacture actuators, uh, uh, Festo, Parker, Hannafin, uh, Rockwell Automation, over here we see an example of Oriental Motors, will provide the customers a sizing tool. Uh, they provide the definition of the mechanism, and then uh, the customer will come in into the uh, sizing tool and will input uh, various uh, operational uh, parameters. Uh, you've seen some of the ones that I develop. I usually mark input with yellow and uh, output is blue. Uh, everybody does it their own way. And uh, once the uh, parameters uh, are, and variables are being defined, 
then the uh, system calculates uh, required torque, required speed, acceleration, uh, low torque, uh, many other uh, elements, including factor of safety. I recommend that the students, based on what we discussed so far, will get into these uh, 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 sizing tools and uh, we'll try to understand where all of these numbers, uh, all of these J's, like we saw with the formulations, are uh, coming from. This will uh, uh, bring in the confidence of using such tools uh, without uh, uh, having high risk of making an error. Here's an example of belt actuator, pretty uh, much the same. And uh, here we have uh, index table, Again, a sizing tool for uh, calculating the uh, motors and the inertia uh, with uh, a trapezoidal uh, uh, move in this particular example. Uh, this pretty much concludes the uh, actuators, and now what I'd like to uh, uh, move into is uh, the section of the uh, grippers. We see a typical example over here of uh, a robot uh, uh, carrying a large size uh, uh, grippers. Uh, grippers may be of various uh, types. They uh, may be vacuum grippers, uh, pneumatic or hydraulic grippers, and uh, several electric grippers. Uh, the uh, other types of grippers uh, are uh, magnetic uh, and could be adhesive and could also be all types of hooks. And uh, recently uh, there are uh, quite a few innovations in uh, coming up with uh, uh, multiple uh, or variable uh, pitch gripper and uh, multiple uh, shape uh, grippers that uh, could be useful, such as in uh, Amazon Fulfillment Center, where uh, parts of uh, different types. Uh, it would not make sense to use one type of gripper, rather a multi-purpose gripper will be uh, more beneficial. So there are a lot of innovation. It's a good area to try to innovate. Uh, this is taken from the old uh, MET-415 robotic course. Uh, here's an example how to calculate the uh, vacuum uh, gripper. If we have uh, a certain uh, force that we have to lift and we have a certain area of the, uh, uh, of the vacuum, then the pressure has to be such that pressure times the area equals to the force. Uh, and of course, uh, we have to remember the safety factor. Now, here's an example a student can follow, a stainless steel uh, a plate uh, of given size, and we have uh, two suction cups over here with given diameter. Then we can calculate the required uh, uh, vacuum to lift this by calculating the weight of the plate, calculating the area of the suction cups, and then divided by weight by the area, and this gives us the uh, Pressure. The pressure is uh, a 1.454 pound per square inch. And then if we have a safety factor of 1.6, we have to have a negative pressure of 2.46 uh, pound per inch uh, squared. A vacuum is uh, being generated many times in industry uh, using a Venturi uh, concept uh, where air is coming in at uh, high speed and generating a static uh, a low pressure where the vacuum uh, can be applied. The uh, vacuum grippers could be either of a nozzle type or a head type. We see over here an example of a nozzle type where the vent tool is uh, creating over here at the restriction uh, the vacuum and here's the suction cup. And then the head also has a reservoir of air such that when the uh, venturi stops, the valves open, and the air at high pressure can uh, actually eject through the nozzle the element which was uh, gripped by vacuum. Manufacturers of uh, uh, such uh, grippers will provide the relationship between the vacuum generator per PSI of the um, nozzle, they also will provide the, uh, uh, the volume flow rate as a, a function of the uh, PSI and then uh, of the pressure which is required. And uh, that, of course, uh, is an important area which uh, uh, adds to the cost of uh, operation. 
Uh, many of the uh, vacuum grippers uh, are noisy, uh, high audible noise, and they require silencers like a muffler in a vehicle in order to uh, bring in the audible noise to uh, acceptable uh, OSHA uh, safety uh, requirements or, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, European uh, requirements. The uh, gripper sizing, mechanical gripper sizing, as we see over here, uh, as recommended by uh, this particular company, uh, would um, uh, depend on the uh, shape of the jaws. We see over here flat jaws, uh, which are less secure, and we see over here round jaws, uh, which are more secure. And this particular configuration uh, recommends that the uh, safety factor for uh, this type of uh, joint will be four times than uh, the safety factors for this types of uh, joint. And a uh, procedure of calculating, the student can click on that, uh, uh, on this uh, link in order to find the details. We just briefly describe how it works. We have uh, the uh, forces which are acting on the gripper. Uh, uh, the force that the gripper has to uh, generate equals to the uh, uh, weight if it is in the ratio of gravity and the acceleration. If, uh, so we have to wait uh, and add the number of Gs and that will determine the uh, gripper force. Uh, over here will be uh, uh, one time and over here it will be multiplied times four. On top of it, when the force is applied, then we have to account for the torque that that force is applying on a gripper. If uh, there is a uh, gripping force at this point, uh, that gripper force times the lever arm will generate a torque, and the gripper is specified for a certain acceptable torque, so we have to measure it. Uh, part of the torque are going to be as a result of the gripping force, whatever it is, and then independent of motion, and then on top of it, we have to add the inertial torque uh, of the, uh, uh, due to motion. So if there is inertial force that tries to open up the gripper, we have to add to it uh, the torque, which is that inertial force times this lever arm. So it's all given here in an example, and we recommend that the student will go through that derivation and understand it. There are many manufacturers for uh, suction cups. Uh, here's an example of uh, Anver. And uh, the student, uh, if uh, it is uh, uh, involved in gripper sizing, can uh, search for uh, many vacuum uh, gripper manufacturers and uh, select the one which is uh, most cost effective for the job. There are also many manufacturers of uh, pneumatic grippers. This particular one shows an example of Festa Corporation. Uh, they come in on uh, many, many sizes and many types. And uh, there is a great uh, variety to uh, choose for. And finally, there are manufacturers over here. It is Taco, a company that uh, manufactures electric grippers. And uh, they also come in various size and type and they are also uh, used in our SCOBAT robot, uh, which we uh, will be experimenting with in a laboratory. So this concludes our uh, presentation, and we will continue with uh, more exercises and lab experiments uh, in uh, upcoming uh, sessions. Thank you.